without any further ado, we're just waiting for the wall to keep going now. So I'll turn it over to John and talk about OWIs. Everybody knows that for blood draws now, that's essential. We've got requirement for a search warrant. Um, April 2013 was a Missouri case. Um, Supreme Court ruled that the mere dissipation of alcohol or drugs out of someone's blood is not sufficient exigency to, to allow a warrantless search or warrantless search of the blood. Um, there, the Supreme Court's holding was basically that it's easy enough to get a search warrant in most cases that in their opinion it's necessary to get a search warrant for you to take blood. Um, so obviously that's forced us to do that now. Um, these office in Dane County, and I believe every county in the state's gone to a telephonic search warrant for these, but it's um, quite easy to do. Um, and then important to note, this is in effect for any case where you need blood as evidence, not just an OWI. Um, heroin overdose, um, going out of the Depending on, on how it's going, maybe even a bail jump if it's a drug bail jump. Um, and the process for getting the warrant is the same no matter what you're looking for. And one of the things we talked about last week, Vance and I talked about it at the last week's service, um, was the paperwork that we've got is geared specifically to drunk driving. One of the things we were talking about doing was tweaking it a little bit to include um, putting on well intoxicated in it session of heroin in there. Um, and looking at the paperwork during my work week last week, I think it's probably easier just to do a separate addendum, <coughs> a separate affidavit basically for the, the heroin and uh, um, the criminal offenses other than OWI. Uh, so kind of segueing into the, the process of procedure for going about doing it, uh, the offense must be a crime. So you can't do a first offense force blood draw anymore in Wisconsin, um, unless it's consensual. In order to write the search warrant, as we all know, it has to be for a crime, not a civil forfeiture. Um, the blood must contain evidence of that crime. That's your probable cause to believe that they're either impaired or uh, under the influence of uh, alcohol, drugs, what have you. In Dean County, the district attorney's office wants us to only force in the event of a felony OWI. Um, the penalties for a misdemeanor refusal are enough that it doesn't substantially increase it over if it's a misdemeanor with um, with a high BAC or a high drug content. Um, <clears throat> so those cases are any offense, fifth or higher. Uh, fourth offense is within five years of the last offense or last conviction. Um, third, with a child under 16 in the car and any serious crashes. Um, with the alcohol and drug cases, uh, or with the drug driving cases, um, obviously not on a first offense. Um, again, if you've got the, if you've got sufficient probable cause to prove the OWI in a, in a, in a, a drug case, like they're <coughs> heroin overdose or excessively impaired by drugs. Just go with the refusal, unless it's a felony offense. Um, the refusal is going to be, in the district attorney's office opinion, a sufficient penalty rather than having to do the additional drug driving offense at the 1 a.m. Um, <clears throat> as far as the procedure, I can tell you that from having done a few of these that the procedure to explain it takes quite a bit longer than it does to actually do it. Um, Todd and I did one a couple weeks ago that I Basically, you know, tied, kind of walked Todd through one and from start to finish, and then we're done in the whole 25 minutes. Um, and the judge that we had that make was by far the least accommodating judge that I have dealt with in all these, um, which kind of goes into how each judge is, is different and how they want these done. Um, so, obviously, once you've completed the arrest, your, your field sobriety or what have you. With, a, with an OWI, you have to read the informing accused, obviously. And for a felony level one, it's best to do that on the audio and video recording. Do it right there in your car on scene. Um, and the, the Chiefs, uh, Chiefs Association recommendation was to do it right away after the arrest. I think that's good practice. You're in the car, you've got audio and video in your car, you've got the arrest right there. And getting it done right away allows you to 
had ample time to get the search warrant process going. Um, well, as you start completing the affidavit while waiting for the toll, um, and it kind of get that ball rolling, um, so it takes up less time. If it's uh, not no OWI, ask for consent first. So um, going around well intoxicated, uh, or overdose, uh, obviously you don't need to read the form of the accused. Uh, it does not imply consent. Ask for consent. A lot of people will consent to it, especially in heroin overdose cases. I don't know of a case that our department's had where someone's refused consent on heroin overdose. Maybe we have, but I, I don't know of one. Uh, if the person refuses, and obviously the heroin overdose would be a felony. Um, if they refuse, uh, start drafting the warrant right away. Uh, so the first thing you're going to do is complete the search warrant form, which you guys all have a copy of. The one looks like this. I've got all these forms in an electronic form that can be completed, like a PDF basically fill in the blank on the MDCs. If you get one electronic forms, let me know I can email them to you. Um, what I do is on my the thumb drive for the L3, I've got a file on there with OWI search warrant paperwork. So I've got all the paperwork in that file, so I can complete it all on the MDC. Um, I haven't dealt with it yet, but apparently there's one or two judges that want the stuff all emailed to them. So that way you've got it if you want to do it that way. Um, so anyway, with the OWI search warrant form, <clears throat> Basically, with this blank line, fill it in with the information you have in front of you. Um, the judge's name on the top, you'll get once you make phone contact with the judge. Um, arresting officer and the subject's name, and then the bottom information at the bottom of the judge's signature and date, time, and all that obviously can't be filled in until after the judge is granted the warrant. So, once the top portion of that form is completed, um, next you have to complete the affidavit, which is the, the bigger staple together thing. Um, and for the people that have drafted search warrants of any kind, the affidavit is basically your supporting probable cause for your search warrant. Um, so each one of these numbered uh, bullet points is a step to the probable cause that the judge needs to find in order to grant you the search warrant and take the person's blood. Um, <clears throat> so as you can see going through it, uh, starting about seven is where you need to start filling in blanks. Um, just the heading is the suspect's name, your name, and uh, how long you've been employed in law enforcement. Uh, going down to 789 and so on is where you're going to fill in the uh, suspect's name, date and time they were driving, um, the roadway, the jurisdiction that this all occurred in. Um, and going on to the second page is kind of where you're getting into the, the specifics of the OWI. Um, heading 10 deals with the statute that they're in custody on this is kind of where Mance and I were talking about either adding a separate check for the, the heroin and the armed and intoxicated cases or how we're going to work that or we're going to do a separate affidavit. Um, going on there, 11, dealing with the informing the accused, what time you read the informing the accused, their verbatim response, um, you know, whether they're going to actually flat out refuse, kind of have it on whether they're going to consent or not. <clears throat> going on to that is going to be your actual, your, the actions of the person committed during the offense. Um, and the forms are set up that they're, they're quite simple, it's all check boxes. Um, a lot of them have like an other line for you to write additional notes or you know, additional things that may not be covered by the check boxes. Um, so know ahead of time uh, and get all the traffic laws that they violated, um, whether they've admitted to driving. Um, whether it was witnessed that they were driving or all of the above, um, their admissions about drinking, their order, their appearance. Um, and then the last page deals with the actual uh, alcohol consumption itself. Again, check boxes, uh, kind of similar to the alcohol and drug influence report form on um, what they're displaying, their order, their appearance, their speech, um, going out of the field sobriety tests. Um, with the information on the field sobriety tests, on here there's not a lot of space, but know specifically what clues you have. Um, I, on one of the ones that I drafted, I had a judge basically just ask, you know, did they do field sobriety tests and what did you see? I was able to just say, I used to all six clues, and the walking turn I had six clues. Um, and again, each thing is different what they want to see. The last thing we did, the judge wanted Todd to read this entire affidavit 
word for word from start to finish. Um, so go through, get it completed, make sure you understand everything you're putting in here. Um, make sure it's accurate that you can testify to it, uh, whether or not they did a PBT, anything you found in the car. Uh, just to kind of go back, uh, John, earlier when you do the informing the accused, um, before you even ask for the consent, because obviously you need consent that mm -hmm. uh, no matter what offenses that you yeah. do it, can you tell them, or are you able to tell them, you know, if, if you refuse, we'll just get a search warrant? Can you do that on an OWI case, or is that? I haven't. Um, if it's one of those cases where the person's kind of argumentative, whether kind of having and hawing on it, mm -hmm. asking, well, what happens if I say no? Absolutely, at that point, explain that, you know, through the process we go through to obtain a search warrant. The search warrant's granted. We're going to take your blood using whatever force is required. Um, I don't know. My, my, my guess on that would be to do, you know, your impression of the person you're arresting. If it feels that that would be beneficial, go for it. Obviously, not, not worded in such a way as to be con uh, uh, coercive. That that may work. Um, you know, obviously we do it on knock and talks. So yeah, that's what I said. And in most cases, it works on knock and talks. Yeah, you can always, you can always try it. something like this because I know you said mm -hmm. that informing the cues is on being an audio, and, mm -hmm. and obviously informing the cues does not talk about whether you know the yeah. cues are in the search warrant. Yeah. So I'm wondering if you can add that you know that language in verbally yeah, and you let could. them know because that's actually what would happen if they. Did. What I what I would do with it is don't. When you read the informing the accused, read it verbatim, then ask, will you submit to the evidentiary chemical test? Um, if they say no, then explain the search warrant stuff. Because the informing the accused is goofy in the way that it's been drafted and it has and the way that it goes in court, you have to read it word for word. Correct. It has to be specifically word for word. If anything's if anything's skewed in the in the reading, or if you try to help someone interpret it or explain it outside of the wording in the form. That can get a toss in court. So, I would I would say if you're going to do it, do it afterwards. I can tell you that every time that I've done an OWI search warrant, I've told them after they say no that okay, we're going to start a process to get a search warrant to get your blood either way. And in more cases than not, the response you get is "fuck you, do it." And typically, the people are pissed off enough that they're seasoned drinkers, they're getting the fist six, seven OWI. Oh, the search warrant's not going to not going to skew their opinion. But yeah, my first throw today. I would just do it after you ask the blood drop, please submit to the blood drop or evidentiary test your blood, do it after that. Um, so once you're done with the affidavit, um, your next step is going to be called data. Um, do it over the phone, <coughs> call data operators, and if you don't want a data number, you should. This is all the department cell phones. Call up data, explain to the duty judge, um, you're going to need to start the OWI search warrant process. Um, you'll need to get them a phone number for the judge to call you back at, so have your squad phone available. Transport your arrest back here to the PD. Um, I know some departments transport to the hospital and do this at the hospitals. Um, it's kind of your decision where you want to do it. I mean, you can do the whole thing in your car. Um, I did one mostly in my car. The person was quite uncooperative, and uh, which I think probably won't cement the PC that he's in the background yelling and screaming for profanity. But it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> so once you call data, give them the phone where they play back at. Back at um, generally within less than five minutes, you get a phone call back from the judge. Um, almost all the judges will say, you know, I've been told you want to search one for OWI or EMAP. Um, give them real quick and dirty without going through the full blown affidavit. Stop so and so for fifth OWI, um, he was driving, like, you know, speeding on the belt line, swerving, deviating from his lane, what have you, um, strong over intoxicants, failed to, you know, failed to do adequate on field sobriety, was arrested. Um, and judge will want to know the person's name, because at the judge's house, they have these forms, they have to keep at their own residence, they'll complete one of these forms as well, the, the warrant itself. So once you've given the background of the judge, the judge will basically say, okay, you know, we're ready to go on the record. You'll end your contact with the judge. You'll call data again. Explain the data operator that you need to contact the judge on an official recording line. They'll call the judge. They will merge the phone calls to a three-way call, and it'll all be recorded. Um, because the recording of that phone call will then be the court transcript. Um, so 
once you've been put on the recorded line with the judge, um, in most cases, data hangs up and gets out of the call. Um, judge will swear you in, just like if you're in court. Um, and I put in number 11, be prepared to read the search warrant. In a lot of the stuff that I've been reading on the, on the case law on this, they want you to read the search warrant over the phone to the judge and have it on the record. Um, in all the ones that I've done, uh, I think we've done that once. Um, so just have it completed and ready to read it if they want it. You may not always have it. Um, once you're done with that, the judge is going to ask you to explain your probable cause. Um, and Judge Gaylord wants the entire affidavit read verbatim, word for word, all three pages. Um, Hanrahan basically just asked, you know, what happened? And was able to just explain it real quick. Connected um, Travis out on this person. DOT records show they have four or five prior quarterback convictions. Strong order of tax hints, admitted drinking at such and such bars. So he had five years. Did field sobriety. Had four clues on this, five clues on this. Didn't complete the last test. And the judge is like, okay, search warrant's granted. But like I said, each judge is different. Um, so be prepared for this whole thing if that's what they want. So now they want the affidavit, not the actual search warrant. They may want both. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gaylord wanted both, read word for word, the entire thing of both of them. So, and all the OWI paperwork is in the, in the all the search warrant paperwork is in the OWI packets too. Um, so we've got electronic copies if you want to do it electronically. Um, apparently there's one judge that a couple of the deputies have had that want everything emailed to them. Um, which you can do, come back and send an email through the copier here if you handwrite everything. Um, or you can complete an online email from your MDC, complete a PDF or email from here in the squad room. We want that done prior to the credit. Yes. Yeah. Um, Schaefer had one judge that he emailed everything to him. They called him back and said, We're not even going to do a recorded phone call. I've got copies of my email. I've read everything. It's something like that. Either way, um, I had one judge. I think the first one I did where they asked me to have an email. At the time, we didn't have electronic copies, and you know, they used the freaking copy machines. I explained to them, uh, I have the ability to do that right now. And they said, okay, let's we'll do it on the phone. So it's like real simple to do. Um, <clears throat> so once that's all done with, you explain the affidavit. The judge will either find or not find a probable cause. Frankly, I do not know of anybody in Dane County that's had. Their PC rejected on one, and I can tell you that occasionally you'll get the judge who will ask leading questions or throw in their own two cents to help your case, um, which hey, it's great if they do it. Um, so once that's done, the judge can grant the warrant. Um, and under 968.203C in Wisconsin, on the telephonic warrant, you're allowed to sign the judge's name for them. So on the warrant copy. What you'll do is date, time, sign the circuit court judge's name, print the circuit court, circuit court judge's name, and what I always do is I always initial an IBM next to where I've signed their name for them. Um, and the judge will give you the correct spelling of the name or anything on the phone if you need it. Um, note the date and time that it's, that it's granted on the search warrant. Um, make sure you get the <clears throat> signature date and time that you completed your affidavit, and on the bottom of the last page of the affidavit, before it gets notarized, the circuit court judge's signature can go there as well. You can sign on the back and on there as well. Um, <coughs> once that's all done, you've, you've got your probable cause established. Make sure you note that the, the date, time, <coughs> and the duration of the phone call that you place the dispatch, because it's going to make gain in the dispatch supervisor's life a lot easier when it comes time to get the recorded copy of the phone call that needs to put into evidence later. Um, once you're all done with that, get a photocopy of the warrant, explain to the arrested person that you've got a search warrant for their blood, read them the warrant, just like you do the drug search warrants, like I said, read in terms of their for drug search warrants. Um, you'll need to provide a photocopy of the warrant to the arrested person, read the warrant, explain to them that you've got a search warrant to take their blood, um, and then, you know, note in the uh, um, in the search warrant that you know, the search warrant is a command from a judge, it's not a request. So once it's granted, you need to carry it out. And the Supreme Court case and 
the nature of the warrant clause, you use whatever force is necessary. I'm sure most of us in this room could not going to drag us to get blood in the prior world of force blood draws. Same thing with circle, if you have to do it, you have to do it. Um, the hospitals may or may not want copies of the um, search warrant paperwork. Um, there's no requirement to provide the hospital a copy. There's also nothing that says you can't provide the hospital a copy. I don't know of any hospital that's demanded copies or asked for copies. But if they want one, I don't see a reason not to. It's just an additional photocopy of the hospital. Um, so again, once you've got your warrant, you've granted your warrant, you've read your warrant, um, go ahead and complete the blood draw, just as we would with any other blood draw. Um, complete the arrest, you know, probably looking at the other guy. Um, <coughs> come back and then for your report, if you're dictated a report, a couple things that need to be attached to this report that wouldn't be on an otherwise report. You must have your signed and endorsed warrant, the official or the original copy that you signed, not the photocopy. Um, the completed and signed affidavit, those need to be attached to the report as well as this, uh, the search warrant return. Um, which again, there's one of those in all the copies of the what have been packet. Basically, it just says you've got a, you've taken a copy or a sample of the suspect's blood, and the warrant just needs to be turned in with copies of all this paper to the judge once the report's done. Um, so all that stuff needs to be attached to your report. Make sure it's there. It needs to be the originals attached to the report. Um, things to think about after the arrest. Once the arrest is done, Make sure you email the bosses so they can go ahead and get the copies of the audio. Um, there's an online form to complete. The sheriff's department, the deputies do their own request for audio. Um, for some reason, dispatcher said the police department has to go through a supervisor. Um, you need to have the case under the incident <coughs> that the return is ready and attached to your report. It's ready to get returned. Um, it's typically gained or a detective is going to have to return that the next business day to the judge's office. Also request a copy of the record call. This is where it's important to have a case number because we're going to need that at the records, uh, dispatch records, and the date and time the call is placed and the duration of the call to make sure they get the whole thing. Um, once that's all done, next probably the next time you come back to work, there'll be a copy of the CD in your mailbox. That CD is your package as evidence. Um, when they return the search warrant, they'll return a copy of the audio of the judge as well. Um, so package the CD as evidence of the phone call complete supplement detailing the fact that that was uh, completed as evidence. Uh, some miscellaneous things to think about when doing these. Handwritten versus electronic forms. Obviously handwritten is probably just easiest. It can be done pretty much anywhere. Um, with less computer knowledge, the, I mean, if you've got the electronic forms, and like I said, I've got them if you want them, if you want yeah. Electronic forms are, are easy to do if you know how to get in the, the phone and line something you don't want to save it correctly or email it. Um, obviously, the front forms are going to look cleaner. Um, either one works. Obviously, handwritten forms can be done wherever. Um, you know, you bring back the key, you do them in your car, you do them at the hospital, what have you. Um, can't touch them already. The hospital needs a copy of the warrant or not. So, if you want to provide one, I um, certainly don't think it's worth the pissing match with the hospital staff to not provide one. If they want to. No, 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 not the affidavit, the search warrant. And no one bears blood draw paperwork. Um, one of the questions that they ask before they'll do blood draw is why you're doing it. And you so check the box, it's for motor by arrest. And if it's consensual, if it's under implied consent, or it's under a search warrant, or exigency, what have you. Um, you know, if it's on a search warrant and they ask for a copy of the warrant, there's certainly no big deal providing it. Um, <clears throat> And then the logistics as to where to do this stuff. Um, again, really I think it's up to the individual officer. Um, I've done them in the car on, the, on the, the squad cell phones and the MDC with a cooperative person. It's pretty easy to do it that way. Um, you can get it started right at the scene of the stop, get that first, get all the paperwork completed right at the scene of the stop, wait for the tow. Come back to the PD, drive right to the hospital, and place the phone call sitting in the parking lot of Meritor. Done that. Um, the last one that we did, one tie that we brought the person back here, had us in the interview room, they're on audio and video recording in the interview room, which gave us the, they're secured, they're not a problem, gave us the time to go through and 
basically to teach Chad how to do it and then go through and do the phone call with the judge. Um, so again, it's you know, all logistics as to what's going to work best for you. Um, if it's two officers working together on it, it's probably easy to come back to the PD and do it. Just because then you've got everything you're going to need here as well as a little computer, uh, audio and video in the evidence room. All the paperwork's here. The little guy packets, the packets missing. One of the forms. So it's uh, obviously easier to do it that way. Um, I want to touch on real quick the <coughs> flow chart, which was stolen from Dane County. Um, <coughs> if it's not already, I think this is going to be put into the OWI packets, and we talked about that last week. Um, it kind of breaks down into the various responses on the form you make use. Um, and your um, the requirement for what you can do at each possible response. Um, I can tell you that the warrant to get in Dane County is so simple you can do it in 15-20 minutes that there's not a whole lot of reason to not do it. Uh, the only thing that kind of throws a monkey wrench into all this is in the case of someone who refuses to do one, I'm sorry, agrees to do one initially when you're in the accused, but then later chooses to refuse. Um, and there's been some discussion whether or not that creates adequate exigency to, to force blood draw. Um, depending on your time timeline as to how this whole process has gone, it may or may not. Um, the recommendation for that was to contact the NUDDA and proceed with the search warrant um, from having had to go through contact the NUDDA on calls a couple of times. Probably easier just to start the statement search for because you know, it could take 10 minutes to get a phone call back from the NVDA, whereas you could be most of the way through the search warrant process by the time you get a phone call back from the DA. Um, it's, like you said, it's, it's sufficiently simple that it's just easier to just go ahead and do it rather than leave a gray area for your, your blood drop to be suppressed or, you know, or to somehow be determined that it was an unjustified search all the extras that go along with that. So that's kind of the one one thing on the, the flow chart that was kind of different or <coughs> confusing. Questions I think that? Yes, Rob. So John, so when, after you fill up the uh, this affidavit here, um, Call the judge. Some of the judges will have you actually read the affidavit, while other judges will have you go through what appears, what it sounds to me, is, is just like a probable cause. Exactly. Yep. Yep. And that's, yep. that's all your affidavit is. Is it's your it's basically a written probable cause statement. Um, and like I said, it, most of the judges that I've had are are happy with just a verbal probable cause statement. Similar like a, a preliminary hearing, <coughs> the testimony you give a preliminary. Um, we've just had like one or two that wants the entire affidavit read, um, which doesn't flow well on um, testimony just because the way the affidavit is written. Um, and you know, if you don't pay attention to every heading in the affidavit, it can, it can be cumbersome to do it that way. But like I said, be prepared to do it either way because frankly, it's all to the judge. I think you guys all got a copy of the, the 2013 training bulletin that was updated right after the um, the Neely case, which changed the uh, OWI blood draw stuff. There's copies of this training bulletin in all of the OWI packets and on the on Power DMS. I see the Chiefs updated this training bulletin with the flow charts included now too. Um, and I think Chief, you and I talked last week about tweaking this a little bit because I think this was the this was the original layout that the Chief Association had come up with before anyone had really done any of these. I think in experience it's been tweaked just a little bit. Yeah, we will tweak that once you get back, John. Yeah, it's and I, in the training bulletin, judge's emails get some point here if the judge does want copies of emails. Like I said, you can level through it on the, the photocopier, you can email from the photocopier. Or it could be the electronic forms, the phone blank forms, you can do it that way. Um, but 
pretty much the layout and everything that I've explained here is explained in the training bulletins. Um, more or less the same. And the OWI packet has all of that paperwork in it. Yeah. And once you use an OWI packet, just throw it away. Don't try to, oh, we didn't use this form, we didn't use that form. Just throw it all away and you'll create new packets. It's just easier that way. Yeah, because the search warrant stuff isn't in the front drawer where all the other paperwork is. I tried to put a lot of everybody doing it that way. It doesn't work. So. <clears throat> Any other questions? Good. I think so. Any other questions? They would have preferred hospital for one or the other. Sure. I think in the training bulletin it says St. Mary's, maybe, but. It used to be St. Mary's because St. Mary's, quite honestly, was about half the cost of Meritor. But now they're both pretty similar. I think yeah. it's right around 30 or 35 bucks for a Meritor month. dropped their cost significantly like three years ago. Plus, the good thing if you were Knights or OWI Grant, Meritor is back to staffing a phlebotomist in the ER on Nature, who is dedicated only to ER blood draws and law enforcement blood draws. Um, and I know Todd did one at St. Mary's and it took damn near two hours. And because St. Mary's has one phlebotomist for the whole hospital on nights. And plus, with, I mean, Mary does the vast majority of law enforcement interaction anyway. They're just better to deal with. I think they tend to understand the legalities that we're dealing with better than the other two hospitals. And absolutely do not go to EW. Because EW's cost is like over $300. And like, my wife works there, and I love EW Hospital, but they suck to deal with and stuff like this. <coughs> Obviously, if it's an injury crash or something, you don't have a whole lot of discretion on that. 